Sergei Lavrov, Russia's diplomatic mastermind, was at it again. He used Russia's one-month presidency of the Security Council to call in a meeting on, quote, multilateral cooperation for a more just, democratic and sustainable world order, end quote. And he even decided to chair that meeting himself. The speech lasts about 20 minutes and before I give my comments, please watch the speech in the original so you know what Mr. Lavrov actually said and then we'll discuss it here. Ladies and gentlemen, your Excellencies, today the very foundations of international law and order, strategic stability, and the UN-centric system of world politics are being tested. It is impossible to resolve the multiplying conflicts without understanding their root causes and restoring faith in our ability to unite efforts for the common good and justice for all. Let us be frank, not all states represented in this hall recognize the key principle of the UN Charter, the sovereign equality of all states. The United States has long proclaimed its own exceptionalism through the words of its presidents. This pertains to Washington's attitude towards its allies, from whom it demands unquestioning obedience even at the expense of their national interests. Rule America. This is the essence of the notorious order based on rules, a direct threat to multilateralism and international peace. The most important components of international law, the UN Charter, and the decisions of our Council are interpreted by the collective West in a distorted and selective manner, depending on the directives from the White House. Many Security Council resolutions are simply ignored. Among them are Resolution 2202, which approved the Minsk Agreements on Ukraine, and Resolution 11031, which endorsed the Dayton Agreement on Peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina, based on the principle of equality of the three constituent peoples and two entities. The sabotage of resolutions on the Middle East can be discussed endlessly. What is the value of Antony Blinken's statement in an interview with CNN in February 2021 in response to a question about the previous U.S. administration's decision to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Syrian Golan Heights? If anyone doesn't remember, I'll refresh your memory. In response to this question, the Secretary of State said, If we leave aside the question of legality from a practical standpoint, the Golan is very important for Israel's security. End of quote. This is despite the fact that Resolution 497, which no one has repealed, qualifies Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights as illegal. But according to those very rules, we must, quoting Antony Blinken, leave aside the question of legality. And of course, everyone vividly remembers the statement by the U.S. Permanent Representative that the resolutions adopted on March 25, 2728, calling for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip, are not legally binding. In other words, American rules are more important than Article 25 of the UN Charter. In the last century, George Orwell in his novella Animal Farm already foresaw the essence of a rules-based order. I quote, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. If you follow the will of the hegemon, everything is permitted. But if you dare to start defending your national interests, you will be declared a pariah and sanctioned. Washington's hegemonic policy has not changed for decades. All schemes without exception of Euro-Atlantic security were based on ensuring the dominance of the United States, including the subordination of Europe to them and the containment of Russia. The main role was assigned to NATO, which ultimately took over the European Union that was being created for Europeans, shamelessly privatized the OSCE structures in gross violation of the Helsinki Final Act. The reckless expansion of NATO, despite multiple warnings from Moscow, provoked the Ukrainian crisis, starting with the coup organized by Washington in February 2014. This was done to establish complete control over Ukraine in order to prepare an offensive against Russia with the help of the neo-Nazi regime brought to power.
при помощи приведенного к власти неонацистского режима. Когда Порошенко, а затем Зеленский, when Poroshenko and then Zelensky waged war against their own citizens in Donbas, they legislatively destroyed Russian education, Russian culture, Russian media, and the Russian language in general, and banned the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. No one in the West noticed this and did not demand that their protégés in Kiev observe decency, not violate international conventions on the rights of national minorities, as well as the constitution of Ukraine itself, which requires these rights to be observed. It was precisely to eliminate threats to Russia's security and to protect people who feel part of Russian culture and live on lands that their ancestors have settled for centuries, to save them from legislative and physical extermination, that a special military operation was launched. It is telling that even now, when numerous initiatives for Ukrainian settlement are being proposed, few people remember Kiev's violations of human rights and the rights of national minorities. None of this is included in the mentioned initiatives. Only recently, in the European Union documents on the start of negotiations for Ukraine's accession, was a corresponding requirement formulated, mainly thanks to Hungary's principled and persistent position. However, the real capabilities and willingness of Brussels to influence the Kiev regime are in doubt. We urge everyone who shows a genuine interest in overcoming the crisis in Ukraine to take into account the key issue of the rights of national minorities in any of their proposals. Everyone without exception. Its silence devalues peaceful initiatives, and Zelensky's Russian policy effectively receives approval. Notably in 2014 Zelensky said, and I quote, If people in eastern Ukraine and Crimea want to speak Russian, leave them alone. Legally allow them to speak Russian. Language will never divide our native country. Since then Washington has successfully re-educated him. And already in 2021, Zelensky, in one of his interviews, demanded that those who feel connected to Russian culture leave for Russia for the sake of their children's and grandchildren's future. I appeal to the masters of the Ukrainian regime. Make it comply with Article 1.3 of the UN Charter, which guarantees the fundamental rights and freedoms of all people without distinction of race, sex, language, or religion. Dear colleagues, the North Atlantic Alliance is no longer satisfied with the war it has waged against Russia through the hands of the illegitimate authorities in Kyiv. It is also not satisfied with the entire OSCE space. Having practically destroyed the fundamental agreements in the field of arms control, the United States continues to escalate the confrontation. Recently, at the summit in Washington, the leaders of the alliance affirmed their claims to a leading role not only in the Euro-Atlantic, but also in the Asia-Pacific region. It is declared that NATO still adheres to the task of protecting its territory and its members. But for this, it is necessary to extend the alliance's dominance over the entire Eurasian continent and adjacent maritime areas. NATO's military infrastructure is advancing into the Pacific region with the aim of undermining the Asia-centric architecture, which has been built over many decades based on principles of equality, consideration of mutual interests, and consensus. Instead of the inclusive mechanisms created over decades, the U.S. and its allies are forming subordinate closed confrontational blocks like AUKUS and other quadrilaterals and trilaterals. Recently, Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks stated that the U.S. and its allies must prepare for protracted wars, not only in Europe. End of quote. In order to contain Russia, China, and other countries whose independent policies are perceived as a challenge to hegemony, the West, through its aggressive actions, is dismantling the globalization system originally shaped by its own design. Washington did everything to undermine, including literally through terrorist attacks on the Nord Stream pipelines, the foundations of mutually beneficial energy cooperation between Russia and Germany and Europe as a whole. 
Berlin remained silent at the time, and today we see yet another humiliation of Germany, whose government unconditionally submitted to the U.S. decision to deploy American intermediate-range ground-based missiles on German territory. Olaf Scholz even said naively, the U.S. decided to deploy a high-precision strike system in Germany, and this is a good decision. The U.S. decided, and despite all this, Mr. Kirby, the coordinator for media affairs in Washington, on behalf of the President of the United States, states, and I quote, We are not seeking a third world war that would have terrible consequences for the European continent. End quote. As they say, a Freudian slip. That is, Washington is convinced that a new global war would harm not the United States, but their European allies. If the Biden administration's strategies are based on such an analysis, then this is an extremely dangerous delusion. And the Europeans, of course, should realize what a suicidal role has been assigned to them. The Americans, having mobilized the entire collective West, are expanding the trade and economic war with the undesirables, launching an unprecedented campaign of unilateral coercive measures, which primarily backfire in Europe and lead to further fragmentation of the global economy. Countries of the global South in Asia, Africa and Latin America suffer from the neocolonial practices of Western countries. Illegal sanctions, numerous protectionist measures, and restrictions on access to technology directly contradict genuine multilateralism and create serious obstacles to achieving the goals of the UN development agenda. Where are all those attributes of the free market that the USA and its allies have been promoting for so many years? Market economy, fair competition, inviolability of property, presumption of innocence, freedom of movement of people, goods, capital and services. Today, all of this has been discarded. Geopolitics has buried the once sacred market laws of the West. Recently, we heard public demands from officials of the United States and the European Union, as well as the People's Republic of China, to reduce excessive production in high-tech industries. This is due to the fact that the West has begun to lose its long-standing advantages in these areas. Now, instead of market principles, those very rules are in effect. Dear colleagues, the actions of the United States and its allies, of course, hinder international cooperation and the building of a more just world. They take entire countries and regions hostage, preventing peoples from realizing the sovereign rights enshrined in the Charter. These actions distract from the much-needed joint work on resolving conflicts in the Middle East, Africa, and other regions. They also hinder efforts to reduce global inequality, eliminate the threats of terrorism and drug crime, hunger, and disease. I am convinced that this situation can be corrected, of course, with good will. To stop the development of events according to a negative scenario, we want to propose a number of steps for discussion aimed at restoring trust and stabilizing the international situation. First, it is necessary to eliminate once and for all the root causes of the crisis in Europe. The conditions for establishing a sustainable peace in Ukraine were outlined by President Putin. I will not repeat them. Political and diplomatic settlement must be accompanied by concrete steps to remove threats to the Russian Federation coming from the Western Euro-Atlantic direction. When agreeing on mutual guarantees and arrangements, it will be necessary to take into account the new geostrategic realities on the Eurasian continent, where a pan-continental architecture of truly equal and indivisible security is being formed. Europe risks falling behind in this objectively historical process. We are ready to seek a balance of interests. Secondly, the restoration of regional and global balance of power must be accompanied by active efforts to eliminate injustice in the world economy. In a multipolar world, by definition, there should be no monopolists in currency and financial regulation, trade and technology. This viewpoint is shared by the overwhelming majority of the world community members. 
Of particular importance is the prompt reform of the Bretton Woods institutions and the World Trade Organization, whose activities should reflect the real weight of non-Western centers of growth and development. Thirdly, significant qualitative changes must also occur in other global governance institutions if we want them to work for the benefit of all. First and foremost, this concerns our organization, which still, despite everything, embodies multilateralism, possesses unique, universal legitimacy, and widely recognized breadth of competence. An important step towards restoring the effectiveness of the UN would be for all its members to reaffirm their commitment to the principles of the Charter, not selectively, but in their entirety and interconnectedness. We can think together about what forms such a reaffirmation might take. Significant work is being done by the groups of friends defending the UN Charter, formed at Venezuela's initiative. We invite all countries that maintain faith in the supremacy of international law to join their work. A key element of the organization's reform should be the change in the composition of the Security Council. However, this alone will not help establish productive work if there is no basic agreement on the methods of operation among the permanent members. Nevertheless, this consideration does not negate the need to eliminate geographical and geopolitical imbalances in the Security Council, where the countries of the collective West are clearly overrepresented today. A long overdue step is to achieve the broadest possible consensus on the specific parameters of the reform aimed at strengthening the representation of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Changes in the personnel policy of the Secretariat are also necessary to eliminate the dominance of citizens and subjects of Western countries in the administrative structures of the organization. Well, of course, the Secretary General and his staff are obliged to strictly, without any exceptions, adhere to the principles of impartiality and neutrality, as required by Article 100 of the UN Charter, which we tirelessly remind them of. Strengthening the multipolar foundations of international life is intended to benefit not only the UN, but also other multilateral associations. Among them is the Group of 20, which includes both countries of the global majority and Western states. The mandate of the G20 is strictly limited to issues of economy and development. Therefore, it is important that the substantive dialogue on this platform is free from opportunistic attempts to introduce geopolitical narratives. Otherwise, we will ruin this useful platform. BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are playing an increasingly significant role in building a fair and multilateral order based on the principles of the Charter. They unite countries representing various regions and civilizations, cooperating on the basis of equality, mutual respect, consensus, and mutually acceptable compromises. This I would call the gold standard of multilateral interaction involving great powers. Regional associations such as the Commonwealth of Independent States, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, ASEAN, the Cooperation Council for the Arab States of the Gulf, the League of Arab States, the African Union, and CELAC have practical significance for the establishment of multipolarity. We see the establishment of diverse connections between them, including the involvement of the UN's potential, as an important task. The Russian chairmanship in the Council will dedicate one of the upcoming sessions to the interaction of the UN with Eurasian regional organizations. Dear colleagues, speaking on July 9th at the BRICS Parliamentary Forum in St. Petersburg, Vladimir Putin said that the establishment of a world order reflecting the real balance of power is a complex and in many ways even painful process. End of quote. Discussions on this topic, we believe, should be built without descending into fruitless polemics, based on a sober analysis of the entire set of facts. It is necessary, first of all, to restore professional diplomacy, the culture of dialogue, the ability to listen and hear, 
and to maintain crisis communication channels. Are politicians and diplomats capable of formulating something like a unified vision of the future? The lives of millions of people depend on this. Whether our world will be diverse and just depends on us, on the member countries. There is a fulcrum. It is the charter of our organization. I emphasize this once again. If everyone, without exception, follows its spirit and letter, then the United Nations will be able to overcome current disagreements and reach a common denominator on most issues. The end of history has not occurred. Let us work together in the interests of beginning a history of genuine multilateralism, reflecting the full richness of the cultural and civilizational diversity of the peoples of the world. We invite you to the discussion. Of course, it must be honest. Quite a speech, wasn't it? And if you've been following this channel, you know that this is the by far not the first time at all that Russia is doing this, that it is putting multilateralism on the agenda of the Security Council. Um, why does it do that? It does so because it's the one place where it can force other uh, great powers to listen to these speeches because it, this is a very deter uh, determined format in which it's quite clear who gets to uh, who gets to speak for how many minutes and, and so on and so forth and it is one of the places in which Russia can outline its foreign policy not only to its own people but to the general public and especially other states in the international system. So while Mr. Lavrov was certainly not trying to win over or convince the US, Great Britain or France or any of the European allies, it, it was trying to signal to the international community, to the rest, the global south, the global majority, uh, what Russia as a vision has to offer for international relations of the uh, of the rest of this decade and beyond of the multipolar system. And this is something that the West doesn't like to hear. It likes to impose its own, um, its own uh, the, 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 the concepts for everybody else. Most importantly, of course, what we've recently heard in the NATO summit, the rules-based international order uh, and the, all of these little talking points of how the how the Western alliance sees fit to uh, to make everybody else run the way that it decides is the right way, and the Russians have a decidedly different uh, vision to sell and a, and a different point with which they want to appeal to the global majority in this forum. So the first thing to say about this is that this was not a meeting to decide anything, right? There was no vote at the end. It was one of these talk shop moments, but again, a talk shop moment with a very concrete purpose. Uh, and the, the Russians will do this time and again, because the, the, in just the same way as the West is trying to just through repetition, get everybody to fall in line, the, the Russians are trying to break that strategy by repeating their more open and more inclusive version of international relations. Now, the West is calling that out, right? And if you read the Associated Press and Politico and so on, they ridicule the Russians for being hypocritical themselves because they're currently having a war in Ukraine. Uh, what they leave out, of course, is the entire backstory of the war which is something that the Russians are trying to bring in time and again. And you can see from this, from this talk of Mr. Lavrov's that, um, that the main theme around which the Russians and also the Chinese, by the way, are focusing their uh, visions is sovereign equality. No country uh, is, is more or less than another one. And this vision here is one in which uh, at, the, at the end of the day, if we manage to reform the United Nations, um, everybody would get more or less an equal say. Now, whether they mean that, whether they would go that, that way is a, different, uh, is a different story. But at least for the moment, the, the way to counter the rules-based international order, which is well understood, means nothing else but the rule of, um, of Western countries and Western institutions over the whole, over the, over the rest. The West is now even at the point where it distinguishes the rules-based international order from international law. At the latest um, 
NATO summit again, the NATO summit outcome documents um, speaks about the importance of the UN Charter and international law and the rules-based international order, meaning rules-based order, not the same as international law, two different concepts. And the, the more this is understood and the more this talking point of the West is being seen as what it is, which is code for we will impose um, our structures upon you and you're supposed to take it, the more this narrative of Russia, of sovereign equality, will have a very appealing ring to the, um, to the global majority and the, the, the Russians try this time and again. Again, another thing that was interesting is that um, La Mr. Lavrov obviously distinguishes the, the hegemonic power of the United States from the, the inability of the Europeans to form or shape international relations themselves and that they actually, in, in relations to Europe, which uh, they try to, Russia tries to say that um, we can uh, come up with a solution for the European continent. Um, they are talking about a balance of interests in Europe and a balance of power on the global uh, on the global scale with the United States. So um, this was this is a quite smart move to basically signal to to the Europeans that if ever you should be ready to kind of do your own thing again and be your own masters and not just run after Washington um, at every every turn and every corner, then we will be willing to kind of negotiate the European security structure with you and find a balance of interest. And uh, as, you, as you could hear, it's also especially security interests that the Russians have in mind. Whereas with the Americans, the Russians would obviously want to get to a global balance of power um, uh, on justice, also in, in international trade. So the sanctions that are being levied against uh, Russia failed to achieve what they, what they uh, were supposed to do, but the Russians are very aware that this kind of uh, economic coercion against them and against other states, against the North Koreans, um, against the Iranians, against the Syrians and so on, caused great hardship. And as I had an Iranian, um, uh, an Iranian thinker on this channel who told me that, yeah, you know, Iran was still able to create all of these um, military uh, assets, but on the other hand, a lot of Iranians were really suffering. And in the same, in the same, in the same way, um, while Russia's economy didn't tank because of the sanctions, the sanctions did put hurt and did put strain on specific sectors of the Russian economy, and did probably lead to hardship um, of um, Russians in certain certain areas. And that things like this go away. That's something that Russia is interested in and hence get, go, um, move towards a world where, um, where sanctions and economic coercions are not part anymore of the repertoire of international relations. That's, an, um, that's also an interesting uh, overview. So um, it seems that the Russians would rather want to move away from uh, sanctions in general, which of course is in line with what Mr. Putin uh, said on, and told also Mr. Uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un of North Korea that they will not support UN sanctions anymore. So we can expect the Russians to veto from now on uh, any kind of uh, United Nations Security Council sanction ideas. So the sanctions uh, mechanism will in, in the very near future be constrained to uh, unilateral sanctions only. So I do not think that we will see much uh, UN sanctions anymore and probably the sanctions in place today the Russians will rather work towards dismantling them although I do not know how you how you do that because there's always a process in the UN for everything um, it's also interesting that Mr. Lavrov was talking about crisis management channels so especially toward the end of the speech the, the speech got away from the the typical blame game right oh no you've been bad oh no you've been bad and Mr. Lavrov started like uh, uh, painting the uh, the future that he would like to see the United Nations to take and to actually start also building these crisis management channels because that's something that uh, at the moment is, is very much lacking and we see the dismantling we have been seeing the dismantling of especially uh, arms uh, arms reduction agreements or and arms control agreements over the past 20 years 25 years and crisis management channels 
um, is on a lower level, right? Just having uh, uh, options to still talk to each other during crisis is one thing. But in in the long run, what what the UN should strive for is, of course, new ways of uh, of checking on each other's stockpile of arms. And that's going to be even more important because we know now that all of these states, the Russians, the Chinese, the Europeans, the Americans, everybody is now building more arms. Everybody is aware that uh, what we learn from the war in Ukraine is that uh, whoever has more industrial capacity to create uh, traditional arms, not just nuclear weapons, but, but you know, just shells, um, has the upper hand in a uh, in a war like the one that we see now, also if you think about a war in, in, in Asia, it would be the same thing. You would need a lot of conventional war materials. And so we have to expect this to go up and it would absolutely make sense to try to come back to a moment when we try to check on each other's war material uh, production capacities uh, in order to build again some form of strategic trust among these um, opposing opposing centers. Mr. Lavrov, of course, speaks about diplomacy and the, the need for good diplomacy. Uh, this is where he, of course, dif uh, differs very, very much from all of his Western counterparts, which still to this point, this day, reject uh, diplomatic uh, approaches toward ending the war in Ukraine because they still reject uh, direct negotiations with the Russians, even though Volodymyr Zelensky seems to indicate that now in the next peace summit, uh, the Russians should be uh, should be invited, but overall nobody has picked up um, uh, Vladimir Putin on his uh, negotiation offers that he has been iterating time and again, and that Mr. Lavrov was again in the beginning of his talk referring to. So the the um, the, the need to use diplomatic channels in order to try to defuse crises and a crisis as large as a war. I mean, a war is an extreme form of crisis, an extreme form of a conflict, and the inability of Western leaders to currently contemplate using diplomacy to end them, that is, that is something that really needs to be called out, and that also the UN should work toward creating, again, mechanisms that would force warring parties to sit together. We don't have such mechanisms. It's still the, the UN Security Council is maybe the best forum to do that, and it's a very poor forum. It's very poor at do, for, for doing that. We don't have a proper uh, war resolution mechanism inside the UN, and thinking prospectively about um, the chances in a multipolar world of, um, of warfare increasing again, also small-scale warfare, we would definitely need some form of um, of UN mechanism to address to address it, right? Beyond, over and beyond the Security Council, because the Security Council will be, again, just as in the Cold War, deadlocked time and again, probably, in most of the, the future um, conflicts or wars that might erupt. Last, uh, the second last point, the UN Charter is still the backbone of what the Russians think about for, for the future world, which is also something the Chinese repeat, which is something even NATO countries repeat, the, the centrality of the UN Charter, which gives me hope that at least on this point we have, we have an agreement. Nobody wants to get rid of the UN, nobody wants to get rid of the Charter, and everybody agrees that this is still the best uh, framework we've got, and we've got to work with it and under it. So um, that's one point of of, of agreement of all of these uh, all of these uh, um, uh, diplomats and and, and powers, uh, meaning also that's why it still works. That's why still everybody goes to the UN Security Council. This is why Mr. Lavrov is able to travel to New York, uh, because the the United States for for all its for all the ways that it tries to influence international politics, it doesn't want to torpedo the UN. Even though it tries to influence it very, very much, it doesn't try to sink the UN as an institution. We might get to that point in the future, but not for now. For now, Mr. Lavrov can still travel to New York and speak there the way uh, at the UN, just in the way that the UN is supposed to work. Last but not least, Mr. Lavrov recognizes the importance of, um, the, of the United Nations neutrality as an institution. The UN cannot take sides. The UN is supposed to um, to be impartial to all of its members, hence 
everything that comes from the UN has to always reflect everybody's viewpoint and Mr. Lavrov is fine with that. This is, this is essential in order for the UN to keep working. If the UN ever gave up on that and if we ever had a moment when the Secur Secretary General and, the, uh, and the, the, the different officers started taking sides and, and, and always um, be with, with one or the other power, then the other power, the, the, the one left out, which is leave. It would just leave and it would collapse. Hence the importance that the actual um, administrative institutions function more or less, more or less impartially in order to fulfill their, uh, their function as a platform. The UN is a platform. And although the UN in the ideal world would be the top-down kind of world government and bring peace to all of us, that's not what it is. At this point, the UN is a platform and the best thing it can do in the future is to continue working as such a platform and create mechanisms of exchange, just like the one that we have just seen in front of us, where even those who hate each other are forced to listen to the other side and, um, and engage in diplomacy.